Hello, this lecture is on reading secondary sources. So the first thing we need to do is just make sure we understand what a secondary source is. Typically a secondary source refers to something that is written about a historical event or personage after that event happened by someone who did not directly experience the event. So for example, a letter by Jon Snow is what we call primary source. Jon Snow is the man who helped to try and prove that cholera was caused by bad water that had been infected by a particular um, germ. That's a primary source, something he wrote. But if I write a paper on Jon Snow now, that would be a secondary source. I might use the letter by Jon Snow or an article by Jon Snow to talk about him. But in the end, I never knew Jon Snow. I did not live at the same time as Jon Snow. I lived far after him. So what I'm writing is a secondary source, right? You kind of think about primary, prime, you're there, you're experiencing secondary. Well, I'm kind of experiencing the second hand, right? Not first hand. So that's the first thing I want to make sure in terms of terminology. The second thing I need to do is to talk about uh, some different second um, secondary sources and something that people confuse with a historical secondary um, source, and that is novels. Now, first of all, you could write a history of literature or a history of a particular novelist and use novels as a kind of primary source. That's fine. But a novel is a work of fiction, talking about events that did not happen, and everyone knows that it's fiction, right? It doesn't pretend to be something else. But I've my experience, I've seen that students think that any book can be called a novel. No, novels are work of, works of fiction. And if you're writing about that particular author um, who wrote a novel, that is appropriate to, call, to refer to their works of fiction as a novel. But don't call a book, a nonfiction book, a novel. It's not. A novel is a work of fiction. Another thing um, that is important to understand is that much of your reading in history has been textbooks. So, you know, when you were in high school, you were maybe given a U.S. history textbook and you were expected to read it. And the textbook presents itself as just giving you facts. It's maybe trying to tell a story, but for the most part, it's understood that it's giving you facts. You're and you're supposed to kind of uh, remember those facts and give them back to your teacher on the exam. Textbooks do not really make arguments. They basically say this is just the way things are. And that is suitable at a certain level of class. It makes sense. But usually in a college level, especially an upper level history class, we're going to have you read something called a monograph. Monographs, uh, uh, if we, it helps if we kind of look at the word, note that the word mono is there. It's a book written on a single subject meant to convince you to think a certain way about that subject. Right. So, for example, I might write an, a book. I'm, I mean, this is hypothetical because I don't know enough about Jon Snow to write a book. But I might write a book arguing that Jon Snow uh, was uniquely important in developing the germ theory of disease. I'm making an argument. It's not simply Jon Snow was born in this year. He went to school here. He did this here. No, I'm arranging my facts to make a specific argument. Right. That's what makes a monograph different from a textbook. Textbook just kind of acts like these are just the facts. It oftentimes will ignore debates or controversies to give you a kind of simple narrative. But a monograph is trying to make an argument. It's trying to prove that, no, in this, in this subject, I am correct. Other people may, I may build on the works of other people, but this is the correct way to understand the situation. So I want to stress a monograph makes an argument and the kind of historical arg uh, papers that you'll be writing writing you'll make arguments supported by facts and it's important to keep that straight you're not just summarizing information you're trying to make an argument so when you're reading a secondary source like a monograph you want to pick up that they're making an argument and usually in your paper you agree or disagree with that so how do you assess a source well first of all you want to know who wrote it all right who's the author and ask yourself you know what does this person do for a living for example is this an amateur historian? Is this a novelist? Or is this a university professor? Right? If this person's writing about history, by what authority can they write about history? Does this person have any clear political leanings or any other attributes that might imply bias that we should be on the lookout for? 
that's something to think about. It's very important in historical writing that we consider the, the person writing it. It doesn't mean we can dismiss them because they have different politics than we do, but we do have to pay attention to that. Another issue we have to look at is who published the work, right? Who published it? Um, for example, was this published by a university press or was it published by a major textbook company or was it published or was it self-published? Obviously a self-published book, you know, you ask yourself, why did this person have to publish this book themselves? Now, if it's a diary of their great grandmother, that's probably why they had to do it. Um, and that's fine. That doesn't mean it's necessarily a, a bad source. But if you're writing a book on Jon Snow and no university uh, press will, will publish your book, there's maybe something wrong with that book and you maybe don't want to use that as a source, right? So you want to consider who published it. And that's usually should be printed clearly on the back cover, the front cover, and inside the book. Another important question is, when was it published? Right? When was it published? So, for example, I study a man named An Chung Gun, very important Korean uh, nationalist. And um, I know from studying him that in the 1970s, some documents he had written that were thought lost were discovered. So what that means is things published before the 1970s are not going to give you as full of a picture of An Chung Gun as stuff that was published later. So if I have a limited amount of time and I have to choose between reading a book from the 1960s or the 2000s, I'm going to choose the one from the 2000s because it will be the most recent research. So usually... You want to read the stuff that's been published most recently, right? Uh, and I've been at, for example, History 499 defenses where someone will, will cite a book um, that is 50 years old. And they'll, the historian will, will ask, the professor will say, well, you know, was anything written more recently about this? And like, well, yeah. Well, why didn't you talk about the most recent work? Which theoretically should be more developed, should have access to more resources and things like that. So you usually want to highlight things that have been published more recently. So I want to give you some examples of how you would choose sources um, when you're reading secondary sources, just to see, you know, what's good, how to, to read a source critically. So once I taught a class on um, Korea, and I looked a lot at the relationship between Korea and the United States, and I signed this book, Cold Days in Hell, American POWs in Korea. And I chose this book as a book to read and write a book review on because it's a flawed book. So first of all, like I said, the topic of the book is American POWs during the Korean War. Let's say that you're a student and you're interested in that topic, right? You go to the library, go on the internet. You said, I'm interested in American POWs during the Korean War. This book is called American POWs in Korea. I'm going to totally look at this book, which makes perfect sense. So you look at the book and you notice that it's printed or it was published by Texas A&M University. That's a good sign. University Press. Now, if you know much about Korea, you know that's kind of weird that they would, um, they're not a major publisher on Korea, but that's okay. Um, the focus is maybe on the United States, which makes sense because American POWs. So that's fine. University Press, most likely it's a reputable book. It's probably decent. And most University Press books are. Um, so, you okay, There's it's got the author, William Clark Latham Jr. Well, who's he? Right? Who is this person? So I looked him up. And he is the course director at the U.S. Army Logistics University, Fort Lee. So he's a professor, but logistics is not history. Logistics is a fancy way of saying supply. If you are in military logistics, you're making sure that your job is to make sure troops are well supplied. So, okay. So this is clearly someone who's educated. That's good. Um, but they maybe don't know that much about history. Right? They maybe don't know that much about history. So you would look at this and say, well, this is, you know, maybe a problematic source because the author is a specialist not in history and is trying to write history. That could be a problem, but that doesn't mean it's useless. In particular, this book would be useful for providing some background information. And in fact, reading the book, that it is very good in that sense. It gives you a nice narrative of um, American POWs in Korea. There's no real good historical argument in it. The author makes a lot of mistakes in terms of how historical arguments work. That's fine because you could just use it for background information. Um, and that's one reason I signed his book review so there would be something negative, something critical for students to say about it. But you could still use this in your research. You just have to read it carefully. 
Uh, to give another example, let's say you're interested in doing the Korean War, and wow, the Korean War history, awesome! I found a great source. So, um, and let's say in particular I'm interested in what Sigmund Rhee, the president of Korea, was doing the, during the Korean War. He was president of Korea during the Korean War. Book on the Korean War. Let's go, let's, I'll have a look at this, right? This may have some good stuff on Sigmund Rhee. So, my topic, Sigmund Rhee during the Korean War. I'm going to look at this book, see what I can find about him. But before I look at it, I'm going to think a little bit critically about who wrote this. So who did write it? Bruce Cummings. So I'm going to look up Bruce Cummings. Well, he's a professor at the University of Chicago, which is a highly respected university, has a very good Korean studies program. This guy most likely knows what he's talking about. This guy has good credentials. All right. Who published it? Modern Library Publishers. Huh. That's a little curious. I'm not so sure about them, not a university press. They're a reputable press, but why didn't a university press publish it? Well, let's go, um, let's have a look at the book. And one thing you should always look at in a book, it's easy to skip those first few pages. But one thing that's interesting is that at the beginning of this book, it's dedicated to President Kim Dae-jung. Uh, and it says they're dissident, politician, statesman, conciliator, conciliator, and peacemaker. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so that tells me may something about his politics because I happen to know that Kim Dae-jung was on the political left. Uh, he was famous as a pro-democracy activist against the Korean, uh, South Korean dictatorship. Um, so I looked up this on Wikipedia, get some more information about Bruce Cummings. In May 2007, Cummings was the first recipient of the Kim Dae-jung Academic Award for Outstanding Achievements and Scholarly Contributions to Democracy, Human Rights, and Peace granted by South Korea. Okay, that makes sense. The award is named in honor of 2000 Nobel Peace Prize winner and former president of South Korea, Kim Dae-jung. This award recognizes Cummings for his outstanding scholarship and engaged public activity regarding human rights and democratization during the decades of dictatorship in Korea and after the dictatorship ended in 1987. Okay, so this tells me that Cummings is highly respected, um, especially by this president, Kim Dae-jung, and by people who were followers of him. They they actually, I do believe, had a, had a relationship um, scholarly academic relationship, um, and they had sympathetic politics. But that doesn't necessarily mean just because someone has political beliefs that they are wrong or biased. We have to read carefully. So you want to be aware of that. You want to be aware that Cummings is probably on the political left and read his work with that in mind. And if you read closely enough, if you're, if you're certain about this, usually the political left is critical of Sigmund Rhee, who was on the political right, and is critical of how the United States behaved during the Korean War. So that gives you a sense of hey, maybe how he's going to present this. And as I read on in Wikipedia, I saw this note. Uh, reviewing the Korean War, William Stook wrote that Cummings displays a limited grasp of sources that have emerged since he published his second volume on the war's origins in 1990, and that readers wanting an up-to-date account of the war and all its complexity should look elsewhere. And um, I just wanted, I'm not trying to hide this. I left this in here so it can be seen. This is clearly from Wikipedia. Um, and the book that they're referring to is here. So I know now, actually, I don't really want to waste my time on this book. This book, Stuke makes clear through Wikipedia, is out of date. Um, and I would maybe be suspicious and my suspicions be confirmed if I start reading the book that's very hostile to Re and towards the United States. So maybe it's not the most objective source. And I would argue that Cummings is someone who lets his politics um, at times prevent him from telling a good historical narrative that is um, as objective as possible. He simply does not have any sympathy with people on the right or with uh, understanding Sigmund Rhee and the situation he was dealing with. So doesn't um, in this case, I think that the political politics does kind of get in the way of good history. But you would know that if you want to use Cummings' work, you shouldn't use the Korean War. You would use the origins of the Korean War um, since that's the one that seems to be where he kind of stopped. And then you would want to find something more recent than Bruce Cummings' The Korean War, may find something more connected to Sigmund Rhee, and I'll talk more about how you could do that later. Now, I want to give you an example um, how this doesn't necessarily mean that because someone has politics means, or is politically active, means that their histories are wrong or bad. So if um, that is uh, Sheila Miyoshi Yeager on the right, um, I believe she's of Dutch and Japanese descent. That's, or no, I'm sorry, she's of Dutch descent. And then she um, is married to a Japanese man, I believe. But she wrote a book called Brothers at War, The Unending Conflict in Korea, which is also about the Korean War. And I read a good chunk of the book, and I think it's a very good book. Now, the thing that's interesting about Sheila Miyoshi Yeager, uh, former President um, Barack Obama proposed to her supposedly twice, and she turned him down both times. 
uh, they knew each other back in Chicago when he was in his, um, I think they call it community organizing, which is de- usually something on the, the political left, typically. So she was active in the, in the political left circles, um, knew President Obama. Definitely her politics are on the left, like Bruce Cummings. But she, I think, unlike Cummings, is very careful not to let that bias get in the way. So you can read her book. You can be aware of that possibility for bias. I don't think it's there. I think she does a great job. So I just wanted to give you some examples of how to look out for those issues, how to be careful so that you can read sources critically and also be careful yourself. So next, I need to talk a little bit about how you read a monograph, right? That was kind of selecting a book, choosing your secondary sources, thinking about them critically. So when you read a monograph, this is an example of a monograph written by a friend of mine, Kevin Doak. Um, Tanaka Kotaro and World Law, Rethinking the Natural Law Outside the West. So this is a book he wrote about a Japanese uh, judge, jurist, someone who was uh, thinking deeply about the law, and he makes a certain argument, we should look at Tanaka Kotaro in a certain way. So he's making an argument, right? So when you read a monograph, read the introduction carefully to to determine how you can use this book, right? Read it very carefully to understand what this book's about. When you read a textbook, a lot of times people skip the introduction. Like, I don't need the introduction. I want to get into that first chapter and the information. In a monograph, it's completely different. The introduction is the most important chapter because that's where the author will usually review other sources. So that's good. It talks about, you know, where that author fits into arguments about history and about this particular topic. It explains the argument the author is making. And usually it includes like a description of the chapters and what each chapter is about. So you totally want to read the introduction because that tells you how to use the book and whether it's worth your time to read the whole book or whether you just need to read one chapter. And typically when you use a monograph, there's two things you're going to, ways you're going to use it in your paper. One is as a source of information, just facts. The other though is for an argument, either for you to say, look, this person made this argument. I'm going to try and apply their argument somewhere else. I'm going to build upon it or I'm just going to disagree with it. Or you can do both. But I just want to stress, you want to figure, you know, my goal is never to make students waste time. I want you to use your time efficiently. You read the introduction carefully. That helps you figure out what this book is about, what it's arguing. That will tell you how you're going to use that book and what parts of the book you need to read. Then you can read the chapters or the sections within the chapters that seem particularly relevant. Don't read the things that have nothing to do with your question. This is why it's really important to have an idea of what what you're going to do for your paper or whatever you're writing about so that you can make sure to use your time efficiently, not reading through all these books page by page, words by words. Goodness, no, don't do that. Only read the parts you really need. Because what you can do then is you can skim through, take notes, and come back to everything as needed. Right. So you take notes as needed. You skim and skim and come back to as needed. You know, you just look through the book, read the introduction carefully, figure out what you're going to do with it. As you do your research, you may come back to that book. And then your, your notes that you had taken as you skimmed, you can fill through a little bit more deeply. Right. So research, you don't want to think, OK, I read this book. I'm done. No, it's like I read part of the book. I got this information. I'll do something else. OK, now I know I need to go back to that book. I'm going to keep going with that. Um, One thing also, when you're using a book uh, monograph, like I said, the introduction gives you an outline of what the book's going to be about. Of course, also look at the table of contents, right? So let's say I'm doing a research paper and I want to look at Protestant Christianity after the March 1st, 1919 movement. Well, look, he has two chapters that might be really relevant, right? This is just before. This one's going to be more important. It's after. So I'm probably going to start with this chapter. I may go to this chapter if I need to, but if this chapter has all my answers, boom, I'm done. Right? So it's very important to take your time. That's why things like that are there. Um, of course, also using the table of contents is helpful. Um, let's say I want to do research on Horace Underwood. I'm going to look him up. Ooh, there's not a whole lot on him in this book. Only a couple entries, right? There's Horace Underwood right there. But um, maybe I can find more if I look up United States because I know he's an American, so I'll check that too. But I know from if I'm writing a paper on Horace Underwood, This book is probably not going to be that useful. I want to find a different book. Another secondary source that you may use are, um, uh, you know, I focus there on monographs are journal articles. 
So um, this is an example of a journal article written by another friend of mine. Um, I cannot pronounce her name. No one can. So she goes by the nickname Bunny, Bunny Tori. Um, so it's kind of funny, you know, uh, you know, very good scholar, very, uh, very uh, wonderful person uh, who we all call Bunny. But she wrote this article, Yesu Wan, an ongoing experiment in the Kangwondo wilderness. So usually you find journal articles and a journal is a um, usually a collection of articles published. I'm sorry, I was looking to see if I had a journal handy. Uh, I don't. Um, or actually, I do. So this is an example of a journal, right? And it is a collection of articles. You can see all the articles there. Um, and these can be found, uh, I have a paper copy because I subscribe uh, as being a member, but these are usually found on library databases. So if you go to the Lander University um, databases, you can usually find articles there. I'll talk more about that in another lecture. Um, but usually journal articles are what we call peer reviewed. So the reason why an article that's in a journal is more is better than just something you find on Wikipedia or the internet is it has to go through peer review. In order for Bunny to publish her article, several other professors had to read it and say, yeah, this is fine. If only one person says it's not fine, it won't be published in that particular article, and that person has to either revise it or try and go someplace else. So it's very important um, to have peer-reviewed articles. They're considered... The, mo the best scholastically. It doesn't mean they're always right. Um, I've reviewed articles and said they could be published even though I disagreed with the person because I'm like, yeah, I disagree with this person. I think they're wrong. But the article still makes a decent argument. I just think they're wrong. Um, notice one thing, and you can see this here. There's an abstract. The abstract is a brief paragraph, usually at the beginning or ending, that gives a summary of the article. So don't sit down. Don't skip that. Read that first to see if that article is actually helpful to you. The article title might sound interesting because you may say, you maybe you're doing the environment in Korea and you're like, oh, it uses the word wilderness. This is going to be great because it's about the environment. It's not. It's about Christianity in Korea. And you would know that from reading the abstract. So you want to take your time, read that, make sure it's actually useful. One thing you'll also note, it actually has her email. So if you had a question about this article or want advice in your own research, you could actually email her. Um, and I do occasionally get emails from people about articles I've written. If you do write someone and they help you, always email them and say thank you. Maybe send them later a copy of your paper, but always say thank you because some professors stop helping students who email them because they never say thank you. Right. So always, if you ever email a professor asking for help, um, say thank you. But usually their email is, is included. So usually... Um, Oftentimes in the abstract, but definitely in the first couple pages, there should be a clear thesis because a journal article, like a monograph, is making a particular argument about something. So it should have a clear thesis at the beginning. They're making an argument about something. Now, one thing I have to stress, usually journal articles, because of their shortness, relative shortness to a monograph, don't have a whole lot of factual information you can use. They might. They're usually better for finding an argument that you can build on or disagree with. Usually they assume that you know quite a bit about the su subject. Monographs usually have more background information. Now, I'm not saying don't use a journal article. I'm just trying to say that usually they can be a little bit more difficult to use. Um, it's often hard to find one that's directly connected to your topic. But that you can usually, uh, and oftentimes they don't include that much factual information. Oftentimes they're mostly arguments. But... They're good for finding an argument that you can build on or disagree with for your paper. And of course, you know, if you find factual information in them, great. Like they're often too specialized, like I said, to have the exact information you need, right? They're often too specialized to have exactly what you need um, in them. Now, one thing I want to point out with both journal articles and monographs, it, when, um, when you're doing research, and I'll talk more about this in the research video, Use their bibliographies to help you do your research. Like you find the most recent book or journal article about your topic, and you can just use their bibliography to find articles related to what you need. You can just look at the title and say, oh, this looks useful. I'll see if I can find it. I'll talk more about that in detail later, but I just want to note that. Now, there is a third source that we consider academic, a secondary source that you can utilize, and that is a chapter in an edited volume. So first of all, sometimes what happens, and here's an example of an article I wrote for an edited volume. Um, 
you see the title is Beyond Death, The Politics of Suicide and Martyrdom in Korea. But notice it doesn't say simply by, unless these people's names, it says edited by. So what a ed edited volume is, is a book in which each chapter was written by a different person on a different topic related to the similar theme, right? So the themes here was death and the politics of suicide martyrdom in Korea. Some people focused on politics. Some people focused on gender. Some people focused on Buddhism. I focused on Catholicism, right? So a chapter in an edited volume refers to a book with editors, which collects different chapters by different individuals related to a common theme. This was printed, published, I mean, by um, the universe, or no, was, I'm sorry, it was um, University of Washington. Um, it was a, I'm sorry, the University of Washington Press, right? So um, that is a reputable publisher. But this is also a source you can use. Similar to a lot of what I said about this is also about journal articles is true for this. Typically, monographs are going to have more information. Uh, these books won't have it quite as much. But for example, in my article, Persecution, Martyrdom, and Family in the Early Korean Catholic Church, there's not a whole lot of sources on the Early Korean Catholic Church unless you read Korean. And so if you were doing research on this and you don't read Korean, this would be a great place to go to to do at least some of your initial research. And maybe you want to argue against me. Right? I argue that the allure of an afterlife was one reason why people came Catholics and one reason why, even though they were killed, they refused to give up their faith. They were given the option, you know, give up your faith or we're gonna, the government's going to kill you. And a lot of them did not. And I make an argument because they wanted to go to heaven. You may want to disagree with me and say, nope, there are other factors. Uh, Dr. Roush spends too much time talking about the afterlife. You could do that, certainly. But so in this uh, lecture, we have discussed right, how to choose a secondary source how to read a secondary source, and the different types of secondary sources and uh, what uses you can make of them. So I hope this is helpful. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.